Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth in Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Skolfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide of Funk. If you don't have your copy, hop on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be glad you did. As always, whether you're watching or listening, I thank you very much for your continued interest and support. Featured in this episode is music consultant and career coach Tom Vickers, who was a guest a few months back to discuss his role as George Clinton's Minister of Information during the 1976 to 1980 peak years of the Parliament Funkadelic Empire. Given his extensive experience and knowledge beyond P Funk, we decided to connect once again, to discuss other aspects of his career in the music industry. Having spent parts of five decades behind the scenes of a notoriously turbulent and sometimes decadent industry that has undergone major changes during that time, Vickers candidly and colorfully tells what living that life was like. In three segments, he shares the inner workings of music publishing, artists and repertoire, or a &R, as it's called, and putting together compilation packages. Along the way, he also closes the loop on some P-Funk matters, talks Roger Troutman, Billy Gibbons, American Idol, and more. And now, here's part one on music publishing. Hey, we have a returning guest today, a music consultant and career coach, Tom Vickers. During his previous appearance on Truth and Rhythm, we went in-depth on Tom's role as Minister of Information from 1976 to 1980 with Parliament Funkadelic. This go around, we'll discuss other aspects of his illustrious career in the music industry, in particular music publishing and a and &R. Tom, welcome back, how are you? Hey Scott, good to see you, man. Uh, a lot of fun the last go around and I got a lot of great uh, input from PFUNK fans, uh, emails, Facebook chatter, and apparently we shook it up a little bit with that PFUNK talk, so that was good. Yeah, people have really uh, left it, and I got to tell you, you know, since November, I think that's our number one uh, viewed show. So, congratulations! Oh, Great job, thank you. That's fantastic. That's great. Actually, before we get rolling today, and um, you can see, I I should have yeah. worn this last time, but I wore this uh, in yeah. honor of your uh, your history wow. there. So, great. Had a couple of questions that came in from viewers on that last session, Tom. Okay. Um, you had mentioned that uh, Eddie Hazel did some jail, jail time, and that's kind of known, but there was some murkiness about exactly when that was and what the cause of it was. All right, I'll start with the cause of it. Um, Eddie uh, wasn't afraid of a psychedelic or virtually any drug, and he was touring with Parliament Funkadelic. This is before Michael Hampton joined the band, so we're talking about I'm going to say late 74, maybe 1975, somewhere in there. And he was on an air flight and he dropped a little something before he got on the plane. I don't know, some form of a hallucinogenic. And he had one of those Twilight Zone episodes where he's on the plane, he's looking outside. All of a sudden, he sees something on the wing of the plane in his mind. And he freaks out. He like told, oh, they're gonna crash the plane, oh my God. And he literally has a panic attack, but not just a panic attack, a full blown freak out on the plane. Mm -hmm. Stewardesses are coming and you know, this is before air marshals and all that other nonsense, but they, he was so agitated and so freaked that um, they literally had to, you know, hold him down and divert the plane and have it land. And once the plane landed, uh, police came on board and arrested him for disturbing, you know, the flight crew or, you know, some, whether it's a trumped up charge or not. And he ended up serving two years in Lompoc prison uh, here in California. And um, it sort of, interrupted his career on the one hand, but it also uh, enabled him, 
once he got out to do the Eddie Hazel solo album, which was the first album that George put out in conjunction with his deal with Warner Brothers Records, the Game Dames and D Guitar Thangs album. And uh, Eddie was an incredible guitar player, sort of an enigmatic character. He was very soft-spoken. He wouldn't reveal a whole lot about himself, but uh, he put a guitar on him and the guitar did the talking, so. Did, did, did you or anyone else in the, in the camp visit him while he was incarcerated? I didn't. Um, I was checking into the P-Funk world just as he was getting out of Lobpock. So um, I had, you know, obvious dealings with him as soon as he got out. And he did some tour dates with P-Funk. But Michael Hampton had assumed the role of lead guitarist at this point in time. And Eddie had his own career that he was concentrating on. So as a result, um, he did some some solo little dates here and there. But for the most part, uh, Michael had assumed the title of lead guitarist for P-Funk. And Eddie, like I said, he'd come out and jam and he'd play Maggot Brain or this or that. But he wasn't an integral part of Parliament Funkadelic anymore. He'd sort of... He was still involved, he was still part of it, but not a touring constant member of it, so. Thanks. The uh, other question we had, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but we'll find out. During, uh, this predates you somewhat, but um, during the recording of, of Funkadelic tracks like Standing on the Verge and Red Hot Mama, I guess there's a rumor out there that it was Rare Earth's rhythm section that sat in and played on some of those tracks. Do you know anything about that? I I don't know, but anything's possible. They were all in Detroit. Um, the subsequent manager of, of P-Funk, there were three. One was a guy named Ron Strasner, and he was out of Detroit and had been Rare Earth's manager. So it is possible. Uh, you know, anything's possible. I this is the first I've heard of that, but you know, it's possible. I don't have any proof, so we'll, we'll continue to try to hunt that one down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, move into talking about uh, some stuff more directly tied to your your current experience. And you know, on this show, so many times the topic of music publishing has come up, and it's always in uh, the framework of. You know, you got to have your ducks in the row and you got to make sure you secure your music publishing because that's so much of where your livelihood's going to come from, especially down the line. And so many artists have kind of let that slip, especially, you know, a lot of the funk guys and the R&B guys from the, the 70s and, and older than that. So, uh, Tom, how'd you get into that and, and what advice do you have for us and who are some of the uh, notable acts that you worked with on that? Okay. Um I didn't know anything about music publishing until I, uh, well, I first started at A&M Records after Parliament Funkadelic in 1980. And what happened was, as I may have mentioned in the last episode, I was seeing the mothership kind of crash and burn. Um, things were going downhill fast. George was losing record deals. And I was like, oh, my God, what do I do now? A friend of mine called me up and said, hey, they're looking for a uh, publicist at A&M Records, and I put your name in the hat. And about a week later, I got a call from a guy named Mike Gormley, who was head of publicity there. <coughs> really nice guy. We had a meeting, and lo and behold, I was hired. I'm like, wow, this is pretty amazing. So <coughs> I... Um, I'm there three weeks, and Mike Gormley is fired. Unceremoniously, boom, gone. So the woman who was in sort of the second in command became first in command. And <clears throat> I'm not going to say she was difficult to deal with, but she didn't hire me. I wasn't her person. So as a result, uh, we kind of locked horns every now and then. And then the other issue was I was on the A&M lot. I was right in Hollywood. And if Herb Alpert or Jerry Moss needed something, 
they would call me, Tom, can you come into my office now? You know, we need a press release written or something. So I was there on the lot and dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with the artists, the management, the personnel of the record label, going to marketing meetings, all this type of stuff. And that created a bit of tension between me and this person in New York, which down the road meant I was sort of, uh, after a year and a half there, unceremoniously shown the door. But I had made so many good contacts and friends there. And one of them was a guy named Lance Freed. And he was head of Almo Irving Music. Almo stands for Alpert, A-L, and Moss, M-O, Almo Irving Music. So they had just bought the East Memphis Music Catalog, which was all the great stacks stuff. Everything from respect, born under a bad sign, knock on wood, soul man, blah, blah, blah. So the first thing that he asked me if I'd be interested in doing was help put together what became a very rare and sort of cool publishing set called the East Memphis Music Box Set, The Hits. And it was a five LP set along with a booklet. And in the booklet, all the lyrics to various songs, uh, You Got Me Humming, uh, Knock on Wood, Let's Stay Together, all the Al Green stuff, uh, Staple Singers, Bing, Bing, Bing. And I needed some liner notes. So I wrote the liner notes. I helped put together the track selection. Um, and that sort of, got me into, wow, they've got this incredible catalog and all this East Memphis music, bing, bing, bing. Now, they had purchased this and they were trying to monetize it as quickly as possible. And there was talk about doing an Otis Redding biopic, sort of like the Ray Charles, the James Brown, the Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it. So they wanted to do script research on, uh, Otis Redding, and I was hired by Lance Freed to go and meet with all these amazing people who had something to do with Otis's career. Everybody from his valet, a guy named Speedo Sims, to Rufus Thomas and Carla Thomas, to Steve Cropper, Booker T. Jones, uh, if anybody had anything to do with Otis, I met with Jerry Wexler, I'm at Erdogan, uh, Jim Stewart at Stax Records, a DJ down who was the first to play Otis, a guy named Hamp Swain, uh, just all these amazing characters who are part of Otis's uh, life and career. And I got to meet them and interview them. So again, pinching myself, I went to Otis's big O, ranch uh, outside of Macon, Georgia. I met his wife, you know, Zelma, the kids, and just had, you know, wow, this is too good to be true. And I had a little cassette recorder and I'd go around and interview all these people. So I brought it all back to um, Los Angeles and Lance Freed said to me, look, you obviously know this stuff probably better than anybody on the staff. I want to hire you but I don't have an opening right now. But as soon as I do, you will be the first hire. So in the meantime, this other friend of mine who used to be the booking agent for Parliament Funkadelic, a guy named Dave Liebert, um, had been approached by one of the sort of creative, I'm gonna say second tier P-Funk guys, a guy named Donnie Sterling. Mm. Now he wasn't second tier in terms of his talent, but he was second tier in terms of his visibility in the P-Funk world. He had a band called the Sterling Silver Starship Band. And I, I remember seeing that on the liner notes forever. And, and yeah. it took a long time for anything to happen with it. Exactly. It was supposed to be a part of one, either Warner Brothers deal or his deal with Columbia, but nothing ever happened with it. So as a result, 
this guy Donnie got sort of frustrated. He approached Dave Liebert, and Dave and I were very close. And and he said, uh, I need management. I've got this band. We're down in Long Beach. Why don't you come and check us out? So we went down to Long Beach and checked these guys out, and they were funky. They were the real deal. So he said, come on, man. Why don't you get involved in this with me? And I said, well, you know, I, I don't really want to be a manager. And he said, I'll deal with all the heavy management lifting. You deal with the creative lifting, finding songs, talking with them about their stage performance, all that type of stuff. Okay, great. So how are we going to make money? And he said, because they're a year away from a record deal, let alone touring, anything. So he said, you try and get them signed, and then we'll get a publishing deal, and we'll be able to commission part of the record advance and part of the publishing advance, and that'll keep us going for a few months. Okay, great. So I'm talking with him, how does the publishing advance work? And he said, I'll talk with my friend Ralph Peer, who is the son of Ralph Peer Sr., who's a legendary figure in the music industry, and we'll do a publishing deal. And let's just say the publishing deal was 50 grand, something like that. And we were able to take 20% because this was a new band. They had nothing. We were starting from scratch. Usually a manager deal is around 15. But because this was a baby act and we were, you know, putting a lot of our own sweat equity into it, we took 20. And let's say we got uh, 50 grand. So that's five grand each. And that kind of, you know, I could float two, three, four months. And then we also got another five grand each out of the recording advance. I was able to get them a record deal with a and They put out two albums under the name Kiddo. And we were able to incorporate Mike Hampton into the band, which gave us some P-Funk credibility. And, um, you know, off we went. Um, they had a, a top 10 sort of R&B hit called Try My Lovin'. And uh, then the follow-up didn't do what we wanted it to, but they had enough success, especially on the West Coast, that we were able to do a number of P-Funk dates. And this is after I'd left George, but he hit with Atomic Dog. So he was going out as George Clinton with Parliament Funkadelic. So I, I saw him open at the Beverly Theater. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you were there. So uh, Kiddo did a number of dates with P-Funk and, you know, Atomic Dog was kicking hard and, you know, everything. We, we probably sold, I'm going to say, seventy to 80,000 units, which was okay for a first album. So um, <clears throat> I, I saw, okay, publishing, and I have Lance Freed, you know, talking to me about coming to work at Alamo Irving. So I sat down with him about, I'm going to say, six months later. The kiddo thing was still ongoing. And he said, okay, we have an opening, and I want to hire you. And I said, well, to do what? What do I do? And he said, I need you to be what we call a professional manager. Oh, what's a professional manager? All right, so here's how it would work. Here's an Albo Irving music publishing cassette. This is in the days of cassettes. And these are all East Memphis music songs. But what you do is you get all sorts of songs from all different types of people. Like here's one that actually became a big hit for the Whispers by another artist I got signed to A&M called Gary Taylor, who worked under the name GT. This song is called Just Gets Better With Time, was the follow-up to rock steady by the whispers. So at any rate, um, I went in, I took the job and said, sure, I'm in, let's do this. So I went in and for the first six weeks, he said, all I want you to do is listen to our catalog. Now, aside from the East Memphis music, they had the Beach Boys. They had uh, a lot of, the a and acts, Brian Adams, the Brothers Johnson, LTD, Jeffrey Osborne, all this, you know, big A&M acts. And they had their publishing, but 
I said, well, what's the job entail? And he says, what I need you to do is find songs in our catalog and pitch them to different A&R people in projects. So I'm going through these and I'm listening to them and familiarizing myself with, with a lot of the writers. I came across a writer named Sam Dees, D-E-E-S, Sam Dees. He was a sort of a Southern soul singer who was also a great writer. And a friend of mine named Joe McEwen had originally turned me on to this song when he recorded it on the Manhattans for Columbia Records. The name of the song is Just the Lonely Talking Again, sort of a gospel flavored R&B song. So I'm listening to all these Sam D songs. I go, wow, this is, I remember this. And yeah, my Joe, yeah. The, so on a whim, what you do is you'd make up cassettes similar to this, and you'd send it to whoever the A&R guy was on the project. In this case, it just happened to be a good friend of mine, Ed Eckstein, son of Billy Eckstein, and uh, he'd worked with Quincy Jones for a number of years, and I knew him through Quincy and through the Brothers Johnson and worked with Michael Jackson and blah, blah, blah. He had been hired by Arista. So I said, you know, Whitney's looking. This might be a good song for Whitney Houston. So made a tape, overnighted it to Ed. The next day, the phone rings. Yo, TV, it's Ed. Hey, man, what's up? And I'm hearing this singing in the background and the song playing. And I go, what's going on? He says, well, I'm here in my office with Whitney Houston. I just played her the song. She went bananas for it. She loves it. And he holds up the phone and I hear Whitney singing along to the song. I'm like, I've been here six weeks and I'm getting a Whitney Houston cover. This is something that most people wait a lifetime to get. I so how far how far into her career was she at that point? It was on her second album. The first album, we had two writers named George Merrill and Shannon Rubicon, who wrote How Will I Know? And uh, the other big Whitney hit that I'm blanking on right now, but uh, two of her early hugest, hugest, hugest hits, they wrote. So we had a really good relationship with Clive Davis, with the Whitney camp, blah, blah, blah. So I mail this in, Ed calls me up, Whitney loves it. You know, Clive then, he sort again, success has a thousand fathers, failure is an orphan. Clive jumps in on it, and he doesn't know me from anyone, and he calls the head of sort of the urban side at Alma Irving and starts telling her how great the song is, and she not, doesn't know anything about any of this, but she quickly claims credit for it and says, oh, Clive, I knew you'd love it. I'm glad you like it. So I'm going, wait a minute. What's going on here? So... It, it turned into a little bit of a political mess, to, you know, to be quite honest. Um, I did get credit where credit was due and everybody, okay, and they sort of backed off. But in the big scheme of things, it was Clive and this other person who, hey, that was me. Hey, great work, blah, blah, blah. So at any rate, that happened. But now I've gotten my first cut and I've seen how it works. And I start becoming very aggressive. Uh, I had a lot of friends who were in A&R in &R, and that was ultimately where I wanted to get to. But I wanted to A, learn how publishing worked and B, learn how songs work because there is a definite format to writing great songs. I mean, obviously, you have to have a great hook, great melody, great lyric, all of the ingredients, but you also have to have great song structure. And your ear goes off on musical cues, and you need things to happen throughout the song. Every 30 to 45 seconds, there had intro into first verse, 
into chorus, into second verse, into chorus. And then there's a transition out of the chorus into what they call the bridge or the middle eight. And a lot of writers have a hard time with that. That's a tricky aspect of songwriting. There's changes melodically. Yeah. And then also tissue. What's that? The connective tissue to to carry the song along. the hook, but yeah. Yeah. So everybody knows, oh, you gotta have a hook. But think of the Beatles like eight days a week, you know. Here's the bridge. Eight days a week. I love you. Eight days a week. Not enough to show I can. And then it goes back into the verse and the chorus, okay? So the bridge I became very uh, conscious of, and I wanted a lot of the writers who, there were easy ways to fudge a bridge. You could have a breakdown, a percussion break. You could repeat the chorus. A lot of ways to mess with the bridge. I would work with writers and say, hey, we really need a bridge here. Some of the writers I worked with who became big stars, Melissa Etheridge. Um, she was a beginner writer at Alma Irving when I first met her. And she was playing at a gay woman's club in South Pasadena. And I went to see her and they didn't want to let me in. The, you know, it was like biker chicks and like, who are you? And I'm like, well, I work with Melissa. And they literally had to get Melissa and say, is this guy okay? And the, yeah, yeah. So they let me in and it was all good. But I worked with Brian Adams and his partner, Jim Valance, getting songs of theirs placed, uh, Melissa, a lot of up and comers, as well as, uh, you know, some of the Stax artists who, Eddie Floyd, Steve Cropper, they were, you know, had catalog songs in the East Memphis music catalog, but some of them were also signed on to Almo as current staff writers. And then we had guys like Jerry Knight, who had been in radio with Ray Parker Jr. And I just, how do I say it? I learned how songs worked and how music publishing works. And then I gave you a little breakdown on songs, music publishing basically, especially now, <coughs> excuse me, is one of the most lucrative aspects of the music industry. Right now it's touring, merch, and music publishing. The way music publishing works real quick, a, a, a song, let's just say it generates 10 cents whenever it's sold, okay? Whether it's a 45, an album track, whatever, 10 cents. Five cents goes to the writers, five cents go to the music publisher. Now you can have a co-publishing deal where you get two and a half cents plus your writer's share. So now you have seven and a half cents and the publisher has two and a half cents, or you can have a full blown publishing deal where you get five cents and they get five cents, or you could have what they call an administration deal, administrative deal where they just take 10% of your gross earnings. And that's what happens once you become an established songwriter. So we were dealing with all levels of, of songwriters at Alma Irving, everything from you know people nobody had ever heard of yet, like Melissa Etheridge, to people like Paul Williams, who wrote you know all the big Carpenters hits, or Jeffrey Osborne, who was just coming out of LTD and starting his solo career. So <clears throat> as a result, I would go into New York and meet with all the different A&R guys at all the different labels. And, um, you know, I would bring cassettes with me. It was all cassettes. And I'd call them up beforehand and I'd say, who are you looking for? Well, we're looking for the Everly Brothers, Robert Cray, and somebody else, let's say. I'd go to what was then Mercury Records, and I'd play these songs for the A&R guy, and maybe I'd have 10 songs, five for uh, Robert Cray and five for the Everly Brothers. You never wanted to have too many. You only could, people's attention span, you couldn't load them up. 
and you'd sit there and you'd breeze through, you know, anywhere from 30 seconds to two, two and a half minutes per song. <clears throat> and at the end, they'd say, well, I like this one, this one, this one. And then you'd have specific cassettes. You'd call back here, and they would send them the specific cassettes with the songs they requested on them. And then they'd play them for the producer, the manager, the artist, creative team involved with the artist, and they'd make a selection. And during the three years I was with a and I got over 40 songs cut, recorded, and released with everybody from uh, Hart. No, not Hart. That was too early. Tina Turner, Bonnie Raitt, um, The Whispers, Regina Bell, a uh, ton of different artists. One interesting story, and then I'll stop unless you have some questions about all this. Um, I met this... Uh, woman who wanted to be an artist, this sort of segues forward a little bit, but I, her name was Shirley Eckhart, and she was an artist out of Canada. And she had a song on her album that she was shopping. And I listened to it and I said, this is, this is a great song. I said, I know you want to save this for your album, but would you be willing to have another artist record it? And she said, well, it depends on who the artist is. And I said, Bonnie Raitt? And she said, oh, yeah, okay, that'll work. And I said, okay, so I have your permission to send this song to Bonnie Raitt. And she said, yeah. So I sent the song to Don Was, you know, producer who's a friend of mine. Don, you know, here is it, calls me back, like, you know, an hour later. Oh, my God, this is perfect. Bonnie's coming in but I want to place a hold on this song now, okay? So he would call back and I, you know, once Bonnie got in, love it, this is a hit, we want it, bing, bing, bing. The song was, let's give them something to talk about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it went on to become a big hit for Bonnie. So the upside to working in music publishing, and this served me well, as I segued into A and R, was you you really understood songs, and if you listen or talk to or hear any interviews with everybody from Quincy Jones to David Foster, on and on and on, they will all say the song is king. The song is what drives the car. The song is the gasoline. You need a great song. So not only did I learn what a great song was, I also learned how they worked, how what made a song great. Mm -hmm. And I was working with all these A-level songwriters. I was going to the Grammys. I was going to the uh, Performing Rights Society award dinners, uh, BMI and ASCAP dinners. I was meeting all these legendary publishers like Lester Sill, who worked with Phil Spector, um, a guy named Al Gallico, who was legendary, and um, and it was just great. It was it was how would I say it? It's sort of like getting a master's degree in music and how it worked and what made it resonate with people. So um, that was a lot of fun. Um, I worked there for about three years, but I ran into any number of. Uh, sort of creative roadblocks in that I came out of P-Funk world where music was music. And even if it was black or white or country or pop or whatever, it didn't matter. It was music. It was very um, segment, segmented at Alma Irving. You had one guy who did all the rock stuff and one guy, woman who did all the R&B stuff. And they do sort of pop crossover stuff as well. So in comes me, sort of this naive, wide-eyed, well, wow, how does this work? Whitney Houston cover, like, bam. All of a sudden, I start getting a lot of other cuts. I meet, uh, I'm, I'm getting all these cuts R&B because that's, you know, Gary Taylor, Kiddo, Jeffrey Osborne, 
uh, James Ingram, all these different people I'm working with. You get kind of time cast. Yeah. yeah. And, but what happened was um, I, I kind of not hit heads again with the R&B woman. And she said, look, stay out of my way. Don't, this is my domain. You go do pop and rock. I'll take care of the R and B stuff. Mm -hmm. And I said, "But I love this stuff." And I, yeah, 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 you love it. But this is mine. You go do that. Okay. So then I start doing pop and rock, and the first thing that happens is I meet. Uh, I'd sign these two writers, Mark Tanner and John Reed, as as songwriters, where we get all of their publishing because they're up and comers. They don't have a production deal. They don't have a record deal. They're just pitching songs. So we get everything. And um, they eventually split up, but I became very tight with Mark Tanner. And um, I met Ricky Nelson's kids, Nelson, who became the act Nelson. And um, they said, we're really looking for not only great songs, but a sort of a producer who can help us. Oh, great. Okay, great. So they came over to Alma Irving. They have, you know, the hair down to here. And I'm like, wow, Ricky Nelson, this is so great. And playing them songs. And, and all of a sudden they zero in on this guy, Mark Tanner. And they go, who is this guy? We really like him. And I said, well, do you want to meet him? Yeah. Can you set that up? Yeah, sure. So two days later, Mark Tanner comes in, the two Nelson brothers come in, and it was like love at first sight. They were like, oh, my God, you're just what we need. Can you start writing with us? And he said, sure, great. So he starts writing with them. Long story short, he ends up producing the album that had all their big hits. And, uh, you know, he gave me a platinum album from Nelson. Now, again, this wasn't specifically my type of music, more R&B and funk and da da da. But again, I was a rock guy too, so I understood how that worked. So now after getting kicked to the curb by the urban lady, now all of a sudden the rock guy gets all up in my grill and like, hey, man, this is my domain. You, you can't be messing with this. And I'm like, dude, isn't our job to get these songs placed and make things happen? Yeah, but th this is what I do. What, there's no room for me to do it too? No. So, so now I'm like, well, now what do I do? You know, so I they tried to put me in this um, compilation closet where I do more catalog thing similar to the East Memphis music thing. But I went to my boss and I said, look, I'm good at this. Wouldn't you agree I'm good at this? And he said, oh yeah, you're good at it. And he said, so why do you want to put me in this little box? And he said, because I have to keep my staff happy and you're creating too much turmoil. And I said, but isn't that good? Doesn't that make them work harder? And he said, yeah, but uh, I just need to get along with these people. I don't need to upset the apple cart. So yeah, I said, yeah. okay, cool. So, um, so at any rate, that then led to me sliding out of A&R, I mean, out of music publishing and into A&R. Okay, and well, I, and I got some questions. Go. Okay. <laughs> that was a lot. And, and you should take a breath anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're talking about the whole thing of going through the uh, songs and picking them out, it just reminds me back, flashing back to, you know, I was a disc jockey for a long time and I did a lot of mobile and club work and I would get all of the records every single week and I'd have to go through them all and I'd have to pick the ones that I thought would hit and then I would get the reaction when I would play them. And uh, it's kind of very similar, you know, weeding through all that stuff and kind of getting an ear for what I thought would move the crowds and would click with them and resonate. Right. Um, was there any a and guys or artists even that were sort of notoriously picky when you were trying to pitch those kinds of songs? I would say um, 
most of the professionals, now you're dealing with people who are high level producers. You know, you're dealing with Don Was, David Foster, Quincy Jones, people like that. And these people know what a great song is. And there are a lot of songs that are good, and there's a few more that are really good. But great, eh, one out of a hundred, okay? So I would take, if I was gonna go meet with a super high level producer, I would take my best shot. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take him five songs, I would take him three, you know? And I'd say, these are the best we've got. I think you'll, da, da, da. and maybe if I was lucky, they'd like one of them. But they weren't so much, how do I say it, persnickety or, you know, overly choosy or this or that. They just knew what great was. And once your ear became attuned to what great was, you knew too, instinctively. And because I was trying to groom myself as an A and R guy, I would pick, you know, guys that I was sort of modeling myself after. And when you listened with them, I they'd say, ah, I don't like this one. I go, well, what don't you like? Eh, it takes too long to get to the chorus. Okay, don't bore us. Get to the chorus. Okay, what about this one? Well, the bridge doesn't pay out that much, you know. And I'm I'm taking all this stuff in. And that sort of refined my listening to the point where I would only be, bring what I considered A songs. So that furthered my, um, how do I say it, reputation because they knew I wasn't gonna waste their time and they knew that I was gonna bring them the creme de la creme. And so they would make time for me and uh, it was it was really just amazing to meet people like you know Russ Titleman, Tommy Lapuma, you know name producers who I read Lenny Warnerker at Warner, all these name guys who were legends to me, and here I am playing them songs. I'm like again pinching myself. This is fabulous. But uh, if you got any more questions, fire away. I do so. Is there um, an advantage to on, on either side of choosing cover songs versus original material? Uh, this is a, uh, how do I say it? The advantage of a cover is that the audience is already familiar with it. So in the case of say the Beach Boys, we had the, uh, the Beach Boys catalog. So I got them to record uh, Don't Worry Baby. Um, I tried to get Luther Vandross to record uh, God Only Knows, which would have been mind-blowing. Um, but I mean, I mean, monetarily, is it cheaper for the artist and whoever is, is taking on those songs to go with covers versus originals? Um, again, if they co-wrote the song, if the artist co-wrote the song, it's better for them because they have a, a piece, they have a vested interest in the song that is an original or one that they co-wrote with someone. However, the cover serves the purpose of getting the listener who maybe it's a new act. Maybe they don't know who the heck this band is or this artist is, but they know that song and they go, well, wait a minute, let's hear what they do with that. And uh, like in the case, uh, skipping forward a few years, I worked with Peebo Bryson when I went to Capitol um, I was known more as a song guy. And what you find out in the music industry at this stage is they're different guys. There's the promo guy, the sales guy, the marketing guy. I was the song guy. And I had a reputation for knowing what a hit song was and how to find it. So um, I, I was at Capital. This is again segueing into the A&R side. And I was in charge of the R, which was repertoire, artist and repertoire. I think a lot of people think it's relations, but yeah. Right, no, it's artist and repertoire. And because again, I knew about songs and songwriting and knew all these songwriters, I was able to do one of two scenarios, either find a great cover song to have people do, 
or put the artist with the writer and have them come up with something. So I'm working at Capital, and again, because I have a reputation of knowing R&B and soul and all this stuff, the head of uh, Urban Promotion was a guy named Step Johnson, who I was very good friends with from A&M. He was now head of promotion at Capital. He calls me up and he says, hey man, can you come to my office? Yeah, what's up? He says, uh, we just signed Peebo Bryson, and I want you to A&R his album. And he says, again, tricky. You know, we, all, we have an urban head of A&R. How's that going to work? And he said, don't worry. I've already cleared it with the powers that be. I've talked with Peebo's manager. You're the guy. Okay, great. So I go down and meet with Peebo Bryson. Again, like, here's one of the top singers of that era, in my mind. I mean, he's unbelievable. Really good guy. He'd had a time at Capitol, and then he went to another label, and he was coming back to Capitol, and we were trying to resuscitate his career, both uh, the catalog and getting to sell catalog material, but also to launch him again. It was, he's back. Peebo's back at Capitol. So I meet with Peebo, and he had a really good um, – producer he was working with and we're going over songs and blah 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 and i said okay people i think you need one cover on this and he says really and i said yeah i mean you're coming back you haven't really been on the radio for a while something to you know get people's attention and i want you to pick it i don't want to pick it you you pick one cover song you think is great so about a week later he calls me up tom i've got it what Al Wilson, Show and Tell, okay? Written by a guy named Jerry Fuller, who also wrote Traveling Man for Ricky Nelson, mm -hmm. an old established songwriter of, you know, high, high proportion. So, Peebo, brilliant, great idea, let's do it. He said, we've already done it. I thought, oh, wow, great. So he plays it to me over the, actually, Hit. This is incredible. Send it to me. So he overnights it to me. I take it into the head of promotions office. I said, okay, I got our lead single. And he says, what is it? I put it on his head. Oh my God, this is a, great. You know, number one single R and B and brought back Peebo's career. So that's what a cover song can do when it's done right. Yeah, so that was about 86 or so, or? Um, 88. 88. 88, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so in segueing from and to, you know, obviously the artist and signing artists is a big part of the A&R, uh, you know, uh, equation, finding you know, a band or a singer or, you know, an up and comer who you really feel has it. Um, but the other part of it is finding great songs for them. Because I've always said this, if you have a great song, and I can't sing at all, witness me singing, you know, eight days, days a week. <laughs> um, if you have a great song, a horrible singer can get over with a great song. However, a, a great singer with a horrible song, it's not gonna happen. It doesn't matter how good a singer you are, if you have like, a, eh, it's okay, it's not gonna work. So the old saying, she could sing the phone book, is not true? Well, it is, <laughs> but it better have a melody and a great hook yeah. and, and a bridge section. <laughs> with that, it's time to wrap up part one of this three-part music industry insider discussion with Mr. Tom Vickers, the man who by his own admission learned how to swim with the sharks without being eaten or without becoming one himself. A big thanks to him once again for spending the time and sharing his engrossing experiences on Truth and Rhythm. Be sure to continue to watch on for part two on Artists and Repertoire, also called a &R, and part three on Assembling Compilation Packages. A sincere thank you, as always, to our listeners and viewers on Truth and Rhythm. Before, be sure to look out for upcoming episodes and catch up with previous installments at funkinstuff.net 
on YouTube, iTunes, and other leading providers. We want to hear from you. Drop me an email at scottg at funkystuff.net. Let me know who else you want to see on the show, what you like about it, maybe what you'd like to see change, anything at all. Hearing a lot more from the viewers and the listeners, and it's a blast. So keep them coming. Lastly, subscribe on YouTube. We need that support. Subscribe through the Funkin' Stuff channel to Truth and Rhythm. Show everybody that you support these artists and the incredible music that they made. Keep the funk alive. And so with that, as always, this is Scott Dr. Jiggs Goldfine saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.